In today's video, I wanna talk about why there's exactly one solution in the interval negative one one to the equation x equals half cosine x squared. Now the thing is, this is actually really an excuse for me to talk about a theorem that I really like in analysis that can be thought of even if you just have a calculus background. And it's called the contraction mapping theorem, and this is actually an application of it. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the theorem is, how to actually establish why the theorem is true, and then see how it applies to this particular example right over here. So here's the content of the actual theorem. You're given a function that maps a particular set to itself. And in general, the set that's needed is a set where points, when they clump together close to each other in their tail end in a sequence, actually converge. Um, so this happens in this interval that's closed. So closed intervals are examples of where this is, will work. In general, you need sets X that are what are called complete metric spaces. I don't want to get into the details of that because I'm assuming only a calculus background here. Closed intervals are good examples and also the whole real line. Okay, so the other condition is that this function needs to be an actual contraction. What that means is that the output of the function on two values x and y, their difference in absolute value is less than or equal to the absolute value of x minus y times a constant c. And this constant c is going to satisfy that it is strictly between 0 and 1. So let's look at the actual geometric interpretation of what this last statement is saying. So imagine you had a number line, and you had the points x and y over here. Then this function is mapping f of x somewhere, maybe a max of f of x over here somewhere. But the point is that because this constant c is between 0 and 1, f of x is closer to f of y than x was to y. So what's the conclusion of this actual theorem given these ingredients? So the conclusion is that f has a unique fixed point. What does that mean? It means there's a unique point C such that F of C is equal to C. Okay, we can kind of see how this might start to play in our previous example. Here, we're looking for a unique point X so that X is equal to this thing right over here. So we'll see that when we actually make the application. Okay, so let's take a look at how we'd actually prove a theorem like this. So there are a few things we need to prove. First, that there is a fixed point. And then secondly, that the fixed point is unique. All right, so we're going to take steps to actually go ahead and do this. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is establish a few properties of this function. So first of all, we're going to establish that this function is continuous using the fact that it's a contraction. So we could use the analysis definition of continuity, but I want to use the definition of continuity that we're sort of typically um, versed with in regular calculus. So the thing we need to check is that the limit as x approaches a particular value a of f of x is equal to f of a. And we can kind of see why just given the condition that we have. As x approaches a, c times the absolute value of x minus a will go to zero. Right? And since this bounds above this expression right over here, that tells us that the absolute value of f of x minus f of a is going to go to zero as well. And so f of x is going to approach f of a. And so we do have this limit right over here. And so our function f is, in fact, continuous. That'll be very helpful for us in the future. Okay, so now how do we actually go about establishing that we have a fixed point? We'll eventually get to the fact that it's unique, but really we want to focus on this part right over here. So the idea is actually constructive. So we noticed in the diagram earlier that points get closer together after iterating this function f. So what we're going to do is pick a random point a, and then we're going to apply f to it iteratively. So we'll take f of a, f of f of a, etc. And that's going to create an entire sequence of points in our interval. All right, so we're going to label these points a little bit differently. I'll call this first one x0, this one x1, 
x2, x3, etc. So we're going to make some observations about this interesting sequence that we just wrote down. The first thing I want to notice is that you can get an interesting upper bound on the absolute value of two consecutive terms, xn minus xn minus 1. And this upper bound will be some concrete thing that will go much, much, much smaller or become much, much, much smaller as n increases. Let's take a look at why. Okay, so if you look at how these sequences are constructed, this is equal to the absolute value of f of x n minus 1 minus f x n minus 2. And because we're a contraction, this is less than or equal to c times the absolute value of x n minus 1 minus x n minus 2. So write this as c to the 1. Now, if we do this again, by the same argument, we'll get this is less than or equal to c times this entire quantity. So it's c squared times the absolute value of x n minus 2 minus x n minus 3. Okay, so if we keep iterating then, eventually this is going to be less than or equal to c to some power times x sub 1 minus x sub 0. And we know that the power is governed by these indices right over here. To get the actual power, it's going to be n minus whatever the first index is. That's the pattern that we're seeing. So this should be c to the n minus 1. Okay, and now because c is between 0 and 1, this actually gives us a really nice small upper bound on this difference right over here. So now let's compare all the tail ends of this entire sequence using this fact. Okay, so let's say n is greater than m, and we compare xn and xm. One way to do this is exploit what we had between consecutive terms by writing this out as xn minus xn minus 1 plus xn minus 1 minus xn minus 2 all the way up to x m plus 1 minus xm. Using the triangle inequality, this is less than or equal to x absolute value xn minus xn minus 1 plus absolute value xn minus 1 minus xn minus 2, etc., up to the absolute value of xm plus 1 minus xm, which we can now bound each of these in terms of the absolute value of x1 minus x0. The first one, we're going to have a c to the n minus 1, and then a c to the n minus 2, etc., all the way to a c to the m. And that'll be our entire upper bound for this particular thing, multiplied by the absolute value of x1 minus x0. Okay, now since c is strictly between 0 and 1, if we increase these powers, this will only get smaller. So we can actually make this less than or equal to uh, the infinite sum, c sub m plus c sub m plus 1 plus etc. And this will only be adding a small amount to the tail end because c to the n is really small compared to all these things. Uh, and then this gives us an upper bound of c to the m all over 1 minus c times the absolute value of x1 minus x0, adding up the infinite geometric series there. Okay, so what does this tell us? If we think about this, this constant in the denominator is a fixed number right over here. And x1 minus x0 is also fixed. But we can make this value right over here, c to the m, arbitrarily small by making m large enough because c is between 0 and 1. So that tells us then that if we look at the sequence, we can make the absolute value of xn minus xm arbitrarily small by making m and n larger than some fixed number. So if you fix a number, capital N, then for M and N greater than that capital N, we can make all of the values right over here 
small enough because this numerator here will be tiny. Okay, so if you have a sequence where the tail terms eventually clump together, the name for such a sequence is often referred to in analysis as a Cauchy sequence. And one of the things you learn in an analysis course is that Cauchy sequences always converge. So this sequence, being a Cauchy sequence, has to actually converge in this particular family of spaces that we're considering, which happens to work for closed intervals in particular. So this sequence, iterating f on the point a that we started with, a random point a, actually gives us a sequence that converges. So let's take a look at what the limit of that sequence is. So I'm going to let c be the limit as n approaches infinity of x sub n. All right. Now, we established that f itself is continuous. So if we look at f of c, that is f of the limit as n approaches infinity of xn. Okay, but by continuity, this is the same as the limit as n approaches infinity of f of xn. Okay, but f of xn, by the way we constructed our sequence, is actually related to x itself. This is the limit as n approaches infinity of, well, let's take a look, f of any particular x, this is x2, for example, f of x2 is x3. So this is the limit as n approaches infinity of x sub n plus 1, but that's our original sequence that we started with, so this is c itself. And so we notice that this particular limit of this iterated sequence is actually the fixed point that we were looking for in the first place. So we do have a fixed point, and the question now that remains is why is this fixed point unique? Well, let's say we had two fixed points, a and a prime. So f of a is a, and f of a prime is a prime then the condition of being a contraction tells us that the absolute value of a minus a prime, that has, that's a non-negative number, and that actually has to equal the absolute value of f of a minus f of a prime, because f of a is a, and f of a prime is a prime. But then at the same time, this is less than or equal to a constant times the absolute value of a minus a prime. But this constant here is strictly between 0 and 1. So the only way you have some non-negative number that's less than or equal to a constant multiple between 0 and 1 times that non-negative number is if that non-negative number is actually 0 itself. So it must be the case that these two things are actually equal, and so our fixed point is actually unique. This is a really fascinating theorem. I love it, and I love talking about it. Um, so let's take a look at the actual application of it to the original problem that we had. So our original problem was to figure out why we have a unique solution in the interval negative 1, 1 to the equation x equals half cosine x squared. So a natural candidate for the function to define here is f of x equal to a half cosine squared x. All right, so the thing we want to check, hopefully, is that this thing is actually a contraction mapping on the interval 1, negative 1, 1, and if it is then we're going to be happy and know that there's a unique fixed point. All right, so let's take a look at the actual function itself. So we want to show that f of x minus f of y in absolute value is less than or equal to a constant times the absolute value of x minus y. The only problem is we don't really know how to do this with this particular function, but there is something that can help us, and that's the mean value theorem, which I had of the video on previously. And that allows us to construct something like this. If we think about values x and y inside of this interval here, let's suppose x is less than y, then the mean value theorem tells us that the absolute value of x minus of f of x minus f of y is less than or equal to the absolute value of f prime at little c times the absolute value of x minus y. And this is actually an equality, not uh, less than or equal to. And this is for some c in the open interval between x and y. 
Okay, so if we look at the actual function we're dealing with here, it's the function of half cosine x squared. Its derivative is 2 times a half cosine x times the derivative of cosine x, which is negative sine x. And if we put that all together, this is equal to negative cos x sine x. And we're looking at it on the interval negative 1, 1. Now we can actually combine this together and get that this is equal to negative 1 half sine 2x. Okay, so this value right here is actually the absolute value of negative half sine 2c for some value c in the random interval x, y that we have. Now, this can be rewritten as 1 half times the absolute value of sine of 2c. And since the sine of any angle is between negative 1 and 1, this value right here is between negative 1 half and 1 half. But it's actually non-negative, so this is actually between 0 and 1 half. So no matter what, the absolute value of f of x minus f of y is going to be less than or equal to a half times the absolute value of x minus y. And that tells us then that this is actually a contraction mapping, which then tells us that we do indeed have a unique fixed point to this particular function right over here. And so we get a unique solution to this equation in this interval right over here. So a very, very cool problem that uses this very cool theorem, the contraction mapping theorem, to find a unique solution to this equation right over here. And there are many widespread applications of the contraction mapping theorem to lots of other settings. I really welcome you to investigate it.